to the New York Society Library. I'm Sarah Holliday, Head of Events, and it's my particular pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful event, which is the last event of our winter-spring 2018 season. We will be announcing a whole slate of wonderful fall events later this summer, so do keep an eye on our website and other announcements for that. I am largely standing here for two points of business. First is to ask you please to silence cell phones or anything that might disrupt the presentation. We're really going to want to all focus and pay attention to this, so we appreciate that. And also to remark that our friends from the Corner Bookstore have copies of The Perfectionists for sale in the Peluso Family Exhibition Gallery, and we encourage you to purchase one after the presentation. And Mr. Winchester will be happy to sign copies for you. Um, to give a substantial introduction, I'm going to hand the microphone over to author and library member Alexander Horowitz. Hello. Um, thanks, Sarah. I'm Alexander Horowitz. Um, as she said, I'm a library member and a writer. As a reader also of nonfiction, I'm filled with admiration for Simon Winchester's books, as I'm sure many of you are. As a writer of nonfiction, I know that coming up with book ideas can be um, a bane of some writer's existence. So I thought I'd take this occasion to suggest the topic for a future book. <laughs> a great story for you, Mr. Winchester. It's about a young British man who, having developed a romantic conception of what being a geologist might be like, winds up as one in Uganda, finds it not at all a romantic pastime, and who, upon reading a, a book by, a, about Edmund Hillary's summit of Everest, is moved to return to England and become a writer. He begins as a journalist, covering everything from American garage sales to the scandal of Watergate, from the return of the electric chair, old Sparky, in Texas to Bloody Sunday in Ireland. Finally, he comes upon book writing as his calling. From his first book about Northern Ireland to his well-received book about the Yahtzee River, he goes on to write a wildly fun account of the self-castrating surgeon who, from an insane asylum, was one of the greatest contributors to the foremost intellectual monument of the Victorian era, the Oxford English Dictionary, and which book, The Professor and the Madman, brought the OED as close as it will ever come to being a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not all. His persistence and magpie interests, and I say this with great respect for magpies, <laughs> have brought us rollicking tales over the decades of the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Great San Francisco Earthquake, the Balkans, Krakatoa. Admittedly, he's a bit all over the map. Indeed, he has written about the map. <laughs> he is a delightful storyteller, finding the story within every story, his phrases so well turned that they somersault out. Moreover, he continually reminds us that the world is extraordinary, encouraging us to foster our sense of wonder through his. Did I mention that he has worked at a mortuary, was imprisoned in Argentina, is the moderator of the town of Sandusfield, Massachusetts, and is an officer of the British Empire? Now that's a tale to be written. May I recommend it to you, Simon? <laughs> Putting that pitch aside, Simon Winchester's latest book, The Perfectionists, How Precision Engineers Created the Modern World, focuses less on a specific person or place than on ideas of measurement, time, balance, and space. For anyone who's held a Leica camera and marveled at the beauty of its body and the images its lenses convey, for the admirer of the precision automobile engine, for she who sighs with relief when a book's typeface is perfectly weighted and spaced, <laughs> that's Maskerville in my opinion, these are those who have appreciated the role precision plays in our lives. I wear precision on me, um, this 1960s watch of my late father, uh, Bolivar Accutron, so named Accu for its ostensible accuracy, enabled by a small tuning fork which resonates at 360 hertz. At the time, Bolivar promised a watch that would remain accurate to one minute a month, or two <laughs> seconds a day. <laughs> Laughably inaccurate today. I dutifully move it back one minute every month, so to play my part in the precision of its engineering. And now to tell you all about the many others involved in the precisions of engineering, I am honored to introduce the geologist from Uganda, Simon Winchester. <laughs> well, thank you. That was absolutely lovely. And um, because Amon, her husband, is in the audience today, I'm going to begin this with um, a definition or two definitions. 
Um, there are no synonyms in the English language, or very few. Each word is fit for purpose. And two words which I use more or less interchangeably, because I'm lazy like most of us, in this book are precision and accuracy. But they're actually very different. And so I'm going to dispose of this quickly. I hope this will be the most boring part of this evening's <laughs> procedure, just, just to tell you what these two concepts are. Accuracy, the best, the easiest way to um, define what it is, is to think of a dartboard. And your intention when you're firing your arrow or your dart or as this is the United States, your gun. <laughs> I'm an American now, so I'm equally to blame. Um, your intention is to hit the bull. And if you do hit the bull in the center, then you have achieved accuracy. Because accuracy is how close the result is to your intention of what you wanted to do when you started doing it. Precision is rather different. If you fire the same bullet or arrow or dart at the dartboard, and you hit, let's say, 10 o'clock, not necessarily in the bull, but you do so every single time, time after time after time after time, then you have achieved great precision because you're doing the same thing repeatedly. And this is hugely important as we get further into the story because doing the same thing repeatedly allows for the creation of interchangeable parts, parts that are all machined to exactly the same specifications and therefore will always fit into the assigned slot that you hope that they will fit. Clearly, if you, going back to the dartboard, if you manage to fire or set the arrow to the same center point, then you've achieved precision and accuracy, which is clearly what you, what you ideally want. But precision and accuracy have a difference which engineers know and respect and write to me inevitably. Of course, <laughs> one of the problems with, I should say, Parenthetically, that this book is not called The Perfectionists in Britain. It was released in Britain about a week ago under my original, actually my wife's title, which is the word exactly. The only, <laughs> the only question was whether it should be exactly with an exclamation mark or no. We thought in the end that the exclamation mark was rather vulgar, so we left it out. <laughs> but the American publishers here, wonderful people, said, the marketing people said, actually, Selling a book which is based on a concept, I'm not quite sure that exactly is a concept, nonetheless that's what they said it was, uh, is rather more difficult than selling a book which has as in its title human beings. So can we make a, can we humanize the concept of exactly? <laughs> so I came up with the idea of the perfectionists, and they said, terrific, that's absolutely wonderful, that's what we're going to call it. And I should think within about 10 minutes, people started emailing saying, but we hate perfectionists. Perfectionists <laughs> are nitpicking, pedants, and <clears throat> not our sort of people at all. But nonetheless, on, in both markets, the book seems to be doing all right. It just reminds one how different the American and the British reading publics are. Anyway, precision and accuracy, I hope you have that lodged in the back of your minds. And I hope, as I said, that's the most boring part of this evening. It could go downhill from here. I'll try not to. So how did, how did this all begin? Well. There are two incidents in, in my sort of earlier life which helped propel me uh, to write this book. The first, uh, actually is how I begin the book, um, relates to my father who was a precision engineer. He made tiny electric motors for the Royal Navy. Um, motors which were put in torpedoes and uh, affected the, the guidance systems of them. And he would occasionally take me to his factories and I would see engineers making beautiful little gear wheels and so forth, and that was all wonderful. But I remember vividly, he came home one evening, it must have been about 1952, foggy, London, nobody lived in North London, and um, he came back from the factory. My mother, I was an only child, so the three of us, she was preparing dinner for the three of us, um, he came back with a beautiful wooden box, uh, which had his name, a little brass plaque on the top, B.A.W. Winchester Esquire, and he opened it up, put it on the dining room table, and in it were about 100, in fact, 103 little steel tablets of ever decreasing size. They began, each one was about an inch, then a little less than an inch, and so on, until they became little sort of slivers of steel. And each one had a number engraved into it, 0.375 or 0.295 or something like that. And these were what were called gauge blocks, or Johansson blocks, named for the Swede 
that invented them in the early part of the last century. And he took two of them out, the two biggest ones, which were about an inch and a little less than an inch cubes, and put them on the dining room table. And this gave my mother a conniption. My mother was from Belgium, specifically from Ghent, and her whole life revolved around the making of lace, a very fastidious lady, so there was a white lace tabletop. And my father would invariably put things on it. And if they came from the factory, they would inevitably be covered with a thin layer of machine oil. So she did not want them anymore. Nonetheless, he put them down. But then, to compound the felony, he started moving them about to show me that they weren't magnetic. He would push them towards each other, and they neither repelled uh, nor retracted each other. So having made that point, and this, of course, my mother was just, she just took off to the kitchen. She didn't want to know what was happening. He then said, OK, I'm going to put one block on top of another. So he took a slightly smaller block and put it on top of the, of the big block. And he said, now pick up the little block. And I picked it up, and the little block, the underneath block, came with it. And I thought, that's rather odd, because it just established they're not magnetic. So I held the bottom block with my right hand and the top block with my left hand and tried to pull them apart to no avail at all. It was impossible. They were absolutely welded together, it seemed. And my father, watching me with amused condescension for a few moments, said, it's easy to take them apart. You simply slide one off the other. It's a process called ringing, W-R-I-N-G-I-N-G. -I -N -G. But he said, the reason I wanted to show you this is because they adhere to one another, not because they're magnetic, we've established that, but because they are so perfectly flat. There are no asperities in the surface at all that cause air to leak in and make the joint weak. They actually bond molecularly, and the two pieces of steel actually briefly become one piece of steel because they're so perfectly, impeccably machined. And I always remember that, kept it at the back of my mind, that that's one of the marvels of precision engineering. The second was almost exactly 30 years later. It was in 1984, specifically that year. And by then I was a journalist working for the Sunday Times in, in London. And um, this was a time when editors of magazines spent money like drunken sailors. And they would give all sorts of wonderful assignments, including this particular one. I was called into an editor's office. And they said, Simon, I think this was the beginning of our association with the European Union. Or something to do with the European Union. And he said, look, the premise is this, that the English hate the Europeans. They know very little about Europe and they want to know even less. But our job as a responsible magazine is to educate them into the realities of Europe. So what I want you to do is to find a photographer and then make six journeys through Europe by any means you like, such that at the end we've got six 5,000 word pieces, which we hope will illustrate in some amusing formative way of what Europe is, is all about. So this seemed to me to be an absolutely wonderful assignment. I found a photographer called Patrick Ward, who I'd worked with before, and we took off for what turned out to be about six months of wandering through Europe. And the journeys, the first one was we got hold of a yacht, and we sailed from Stockholm to Helsinki, so we got to know the Northern Baltic, and then got hold of two BMW motorcycles and rode them from Munich to Turin. And then got two horses and rode them through the Black Forest of southwest Germany. And then we walked, at least I walked, Patrick took a car, I think, um, from the city of Cadiz to Gibraltar. So we knocked off southwestern Spain. And then I took a train from the Victoria Station in London to the Victoria Hotel in Brie in Switzerland on the Italian border. And that was the first five. And then we thought, well, let's repair back to London for a little while and regroup and think what the, the, the culminating assignment, which would actually be the lead assignment in the series, which was to drive a car from the westernmost point of Europe to the easternmost point. And we slightly fudged it because the westernmost point of Europe is in northern Spain or Portugal. We decided it arbitrarily that it would be the westernmost tip of Finisterre. There's a cliff called the Point de Corsel overlooking the island called Ushant. And we would drive from there, and this was the time of the Soviet Union, of course, 1984, um, through to the city of Astrakhan, which is where the Volga debouches into the Caspian Sea. So we were having lunch at the Travelers Club on Pall Mall, and uh, clearly we 
lunched rather too well, because it's been sort of doing dessert and brandy or whatever. Uh, I said to Patrick, do you really think I should take my Volvo, which was the car that I was driving? He said, no, boring car, let's try and take something more amusing. And I said, what about a Rolls Royce? And he said, capital idea. Why don't you go down to the telephone booth in the foyer and call Rolls Royce? And so I did, obviously, emboldened by something or other. And, uh, and I rang up Rolls Royce, and I explained Winchester, Sunday Times, Europe. And instead of sort of falling over with derisive laughter, he said, I'll call you back in half an hour. And um, he rang back, true to his word, and said, well, you're in luck, because we have a, a silver spirit, an ocean blue, which comes off the production line up in crew tomorrow. It's a cancelled order. And if you'd like to come up to the crew, we'll show you around the factory, and then you can take this car away for the next three months and go wherever where you like. Which I thought, not, not bad. <laughs> what a wonderful thing Claret is. And so uh, I went up the next day to, to Rolls-Royce and was shown around. And the thing that I remember there, which is the sort of equivalent um, of the flatness of the, of the Joe box that my father showed me, was one very proud engineer who had just finished making a crankshaft, one of those quick sort of zigzaggy things that makes the pistons go up and down. And um, he, it was all beautifully polished, and he had got chamois leather, and it was gleaming. And it, he had suspended it between two bearings and was showing me that if you started spinning it, you could turn it and it started moving. No one part of it was even fractionally heavier than any other because of his superb hand building of this thing that it would, in theory, go on spinning forever. Obviously, in the end, friction would do, do for it. But it, uh, the image of this thing and the, the tenderness and the romance of making something by hand, which was incredibly precise, stayed with me for a very long time. Well, the Rolls-Royce stayed with me for at least three months, anyway. And the, the thing about that, it, at first, it was slightly embarrassing because it a beautiful thing, blue with white upholstery, slightly longer, but it had done. Um, the registration number was RRM1 for Rolls-Royce Motors 1. But it worked actually to our advantage because whenever I parked it outside the Sunday Times office on Grayson Road, the parking meter people thought it would belong to Rupert Murdoch. And when I, I lived in a little village in Oxfordshire at the time, and whenever I drove it into the driveway, all the villagers would come out because they thought Roger Moore had come out of the Anyway, we took this machine and we drove it you know, down to the point of course, and photographed it, and then you know, Vienna and entered through Hungary and Romania and got into the Soviet Union proper and had a rare old time of adventures that I could tell you on another occasion. The <coughs> picture we ultimately put on the cover of the first magazine to begin the series was of me out and the car outside the great gate of Kiev in the Ukraine. And in the background was a huge sort of agitprop picture of Lenin standing right proudly, pointing his hand into the joys of a socialist future. And me, rather impertinently, sitting in front on the hood of this majestic and newly polished machine, pointing into the joys of a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> this magazine so terribly well in Britain, I think it had rather limited circulation in the Ukraine. But the, but the result of it was that Rolls-Royce was amazingly pleased. And for the next 15 years, whenever they knew I was on an assignment anywhere, they would press a Rolls Royce into my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds completely ridiculous. And in the very next assignment, this was 1984, the year of the Los Angeles Olympics, and uh, I was given another assignment to go and look at the gangs of East Los Angeles who were threatening to disrupt the games in some way. So I went with another photographer, which I called Don McCullin. Um, and we flew over to Los Angeles and checked into the Ambassador Hotel on Wilshire Boulevard. And the concierge, when he heard my name when I was checking in, gave me a small brown envelope. And in it were the keys of another Rolls Royce, a thing called probably the ugliest Rolls Royce ever made. It was called Camargue. It was gigantic, they only made 500. It was sort of the Edsel of the Rolls Royce line, only bought, I think, by. West African dictators. Sort of <laughs> and, um, but it proved also a very useful journalistic tool because the gang we were specifically interested in, in following was called the White Fences, very, very violent gang. And the, the leader was a horrible murderer, all sorts of bad things. Um, and he wouldn't give us an interview at all, wouldn't give us the time of day. 
until he saw the car. <laughs> and then he saw the car and he said, OK, I'll do a deal with you. I will talk to you and let you photograph me if I can drive your car. It's not my car. It's a lovely hill, so he would be my guest. So he took the car and the, the picture that we used on the cover of that particular magazine was of this extremely vicious and violent man sitting behind the wheel of the ugliest Rolls Royce ever made uh, with a huge cigar in his mouth and cradling an enormous machine gun in his mouth. Rolls Royce was less than pleased. <laughs> but anyway, the, the point of all this is that when I'm with the gauge box and with the crankshaft and with this sort of rather intimate relationship with Rolls Royce, I was fertile ground, if I can put it like that, when about seven years ago now, a man wrote to me out of the blue from Florida. He was called Colin Povey. I never heard of him, I knew nothing about him at all. And he introduced himself and he said, I, I live in a place on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And um, I'm a scientific glass blower. I make very intricate pieces of glass for laboratories or laboratories all over the States. And I read all your books and liked them. That's obviously very nice when someone says that. Um, but I wonder if you've ever thought of writing a book about something which is dear to my heart, and that's precision. Because precision is crucially important to the, to the modern world, and yet is invisible. We don't think about it. It's like the, the language we speak or the air we breathe. It's just there. We take it for granted. But he said, I'm sure if you looked into it, it does have a beginning. Um, who knows where it's going in the future, but there's a story to be told there. And I thought, you know, he's absolutely right. It is a rather good, I mean, I would get all sorts of uh, suggestions from, from readers, you know, my grandmother fought in the second Afghan war or something like that. Maybe you'd like to write a book about her, I have her diaries. Or, those were not commercial ideas, but this was an idea which, which had legs. So I was in the middle of doing another book at the time, but I put it to my editor. And he said, yes, I think so, except I'm not quite sure what the narrative flow of the book is likely to be, the, what they call in Hollywood the through line. Um, so we don't, we don't want it to be a sort of pointillist portrait of precision. We don't want it to be episodic. We want it to have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so I was not discouraged, but I didn't quite know how to approach it until I started digging around in the very early days of precision and mercifully came up with a number. And the number, which I'll tell you about in a second, was the clue to the way that this book could, and indeed was, written. Precision began, we know almost, well, we know exactly the day it began, which was May the 4th, 1776. So an important year in America, but an important year in human society as well. And it came about, and I should say parenthetically, I didn't know this, perhaps very clever people in this audience do know it, that May the 4th is, does anyone know what May the 4th is? Star Wars Day. Star Wars Day, who's it? <laughs> very good, Star Wars And the, the awful thing to say is, May the 4th be with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that is the only reason it's called Star Wars Day. Something happened, anyway. It seems quite appropriate that precision and Star Wars Day are the same day. But the, essentially the story is this. It all begins with James Watt, who, as you will know from school, was the quote, inventor of the steam engine. He didn't actually invent it. It was invented in Cornwall about 80 years previously. But he made it, theoretically at least, work properly. And you could harness this magic reality that if you take water and heat it to 100 degrees Celsius, instantly it turns into something which is 1,700 times as big as the water, and so you can make it work because of that extraordinary uh, <coughs> physical property. So he realized by building a secondary cylinder, and I won't go into the technicalities of it, he could make a, a steam engine that really had the potential anyway to work properly. But he had a big problem in the, the way he made cylinders, we're talking about now, mid 1770s, was to take a sheet of iron and hammer it until it formed a circle, and then weld the edges together and turn it vertically and lower the piston into it. And unfortunately, because that iron was not perfectly circular, the piston would rattle around in it like a fee on a drum, and steam would leak everywhere, and the machine he made was simply woefully inefficient. It was effectively useless. The, the theory was there, but the practice wasn't. Well, about 70 miles away, 
from where James Watt's factory was in the English Midlands on the Welsh borders was a man called John Wilkinson. But the Wilkinson sword, which you know, resonates to this day, same, same family. And John Wilkinson was known as Iron Man Wilkinson. He was obsessed with iron. He had iron on his land, he mined it, he smelted it, and he did all manner of things with it. He made an iron pulpit like this, which you spoke from. He had an iron desk, an iron table, an iron boat. He had an iron coffin in his workshop, and this was presumably before the Me Too movement, because he would only lie in it when he knew that a comely young woman was coming to his workshop and spring out, you know, John, Johnny Depp, James, 18th century humor. And um, the surprise said, well, he's buried in that iron coffin to this day under an iron obelisk on Naval Street, John Iron Man Wilkinson. He had a business, quite a thriving business, of making cannons for the Royal Navy. And he made them by the simple, what seems to us very simple practice of taking a block of iron and drilling horizontally with a big drill a hole in it. And if you kept the drill steady, the hole would be straight and the diameter of the hole would be, one hopes, the same all the way down its length. So he found it irksome having to turn the drill round and round by hand, which is what they were doing. And he heard of what, 70 miles away in the Midlands, and he did whatever the 18th century equivalent of ringing him up was to say, I'd like to buy one of your steam engines to bring over and help me turn my drill. And Watt, who hadn't sold a single steam engine at this point, came over with all the makings of a steam engine and assembled it in Wilkinson's factory. And it did as I described, but it didn't work, basically, because it leaked steam all over the place. And an exasperated Wilkinson said to what, you know, your problem is you don't know how to make cylinders. Let me make a cylinder for you. How big to get a really powerful steam engine should a cylinder be? And he said, well, my piston is going to be about 30 inches in diameter. And this is a mighty, mighty engine, a gigantic flywheel and all sorts of governors and things like that. So, okay, said Wilkinson, I will make a cylinder for you by the same way that I make these um, cannons, by drilling a hole. 30 inches and a little bit bigger than that out of a massive block of iron. And so and this goes back to this concept of flatness. He mounted the drill on something which was as flat as he could possibly make it and moving it on rails into the face of the piece of iron, you hoped that the hole would consequently be perfectly straight and would be 30 inches and a little bit along its entire length. So finally the drilling process was over, it took a couple of days. They moved this massive piece of iron vertically, lowered the piston into it, and lo and behold, it fitted like a hand in a glove. And Wilco, what was amazed and delighted, and he fired it all up and connected the connecting rods and the governor and the armature and the, and the, 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 the flywheel and so forth, and put in the coal and fired it up, put in the water, and suddenly, chuff, 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 this thing started, and the most impeccably efficient machine suddenly sprang into life. And he said, this, this is it. This is what I've been dreaming of. This is a working, powerful steam engine. I'm going to place an order with you, Mr. Wilkinson, for 500 of these cylinders. And making 500 to exactly the same specifications, that was precision, because each one had to be made, remember, a principle of interchangeable parts. Each one had the same tolerance. And this is the number that I promised you. Because the distance, the tolerance between the outer wall of the piston and the inner wall of the cylinder was the thickness of an English shilling, which at the time was 0 0.1 tenth of an inch. And so what said to Wilkinson, can you make 500 to exactly the same specifications? And Wilkinson said, no problem, it'll take a couple of years, but I'll do it. And so all of a sudden, the Industrial Revolution was born. Suddenly, huge and powerful, highly efficient engines were distributed to people all over the country who simply wanted to make things and now could. And as I said, the Industrial Revolution began. The, this number, 0.1 of an inch, that was for me, the, the, the literally, if I don't mean to sound too pretentious about it, but that was the revelation because I realized that what I could do with this book to give it a narrative heft, if you like was to make the first chapter about things that were 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16
in the next chapter of things that were point 0.01 and then 0.01 and 0.01, <laughs> all the way up to modern things. And by wonderful irony, the most precise thing that human agency has made so far in history, we're talking about mechanical things, not electronic things, is also a cylinder. Um, it's, there are four of them, and there, two of them are in Hanford in Washington State, and two of them are in place <coughs> Livingston in Louisiana. And I don't want to get too much diverted from the main story, but they're cylinders of fused silica, and they lie at the beating heart of these machines that I'm sure you've heard about called LIGO, which are the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories, which have successfully detected now um, the presence of gravitational waves, which Eisenhower, uh, Eisenhower, what am I saying? Mm -hmm. Einstein, I'm sure Eisenhower, there's nothing about <laughs> <laughs> With great respect. Okay. Einstein predicted in 1906 should, by the collision of black holes and all sorts of distant phenomena, disturb the fabric of space time and, as they pass through, would cause our planet Earth to briefly, for a couple of microseconds, become very much smaller and then spring back again, maybe by a tenth of a millimeter or so. Well, these LIGO devices can detect that by firing lasers down tubes 90 degrees apart, which are four kilometers long. As I say, there are two of the observatories. They're building a third now in India. But the point of what I'm trying to get across here is that the cylinders, which are at the beating heart of these devices, are machined to a tolerance such that they can detect movement or a change in distance to one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Mm -hmm. A proton is one femtometer, which is 10 to the minus 15. <coughs> so a ten thousandth of that, you've got to write about another four zeros, so 10 to the minus 90. So there are the two numbers. Chapter 1 looks at 0 0.1, and chapter, whatever I'm going to call it, 10, let's say, would be 10 to the minus 19. So that's the way I would write the book. The things get more and more precise, tolerances of more and more acute as we uh, proceed with the story. And the editor liked the idea, and so I began formally to do it. So clearly what I'm not going to do, because I have the time, and it would be fair, to, is to go through all of the chapters, but I just want to pull out a couple, because what I try and do in the book is to look not to, not to create a peer to perfection, to, to precision, but to look at its effects, its social effects, and to ask whether it's <coughs> a good thing. It is a marvelous thing, but is it, is it a good thing? And two aspects occurred very early on which seemed to signal something in terms of society. The first, um, I mean, you would think, would you not, that, that guns and clocks which are hugely important, particularly in the United States, were beneficiaries of the, of the new zeal for making things that were very precise. But two other things that you wouldn't perhaps normally think of um, indicate the social consequences of what's going on. The first relates to something, the social movement that the Industrial Revolution created. Because up to that point, let's say 1785, 1790, the wealthy in England would just stick with England for the time being, tended to live in the countryside. They lived in large houses, mansions, castles, granges, manors, or whatever. And they were protected by distance and by fields and meadows and by edges and fences and ha -has and so forth, and by servants from anyone who might wish to assault them or rob them or whatever. But all of a sudden now, people, thanks to Watt and his steam engines, Factories were being were springing up in cities which were themselves growing, London and Manchester and Liverpool and Birmingham. Things were being made, with these gigantic machines throwing away. And people were making, as a consequence, fortunes. And they were living, these new nouveau riche, were living close to the factories. They were living, in other words, in cities where they hitherto had not really lived in any large numbers. Well, this was also the time of the French Revolution, so a lot of People were escaping from France, and also in the cities there were a lot of, as there had always been, a lot of impoverished people. So all of a sudden you have this situation of very rich, new-made new millionaires, or whatever they were, living cheek by jowl with you know, disaffected French revolutionaries and angry and impoverished English people. And this led inevitably to envy, 
and envy leads to crime. And so these rich people suddenly started to feel somewhat insecure in their lives. And they built themselves very sturdy houses, protected by thick front doors, protected by impeccably made, precision engineered locks of extraordinary complexity. All <coughs> cylinders. I mean, the cylinder is a very important component in, 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 in early precision engineering. And the principal maker of these locks in the close of the 18th century was a man called Joseph Brammer. Joseph B A R A M A H. And Joseph Brammer was a remarkable inventor. He made the first flush toilet. Mm -hmm. He made the beer engine, which allowed uh, someone to pull a pipe without having to go every 15 minutes and get a new barrel from the cellar. He had a sort of hydraulic thing which enabled the bartender to do this. And there are several pubs named in Joseph Brammer's honor to this day. He made a machine for counting banknotes. So every time you go to the bank and see one of these things, that's Brammer's doing. He also invented the fountain pen. And just to cover his bets, in case it didn't work properly, he made another machine which could create and sharpen quills in very large numbers. So that if the fountain pen didn't catch on, then, then the quill would become very cheap and very, very inexpensive. But he also made locks. He was fascinated with how you make a lock. And he made a particular one. It was about that big, I suppose, and a cylinder about that diameter. And it had within it, I think, 18 levers, and it had springs, and all sorts of devices, which made it, in his view, unpickable. And he had a showroom, the western end of Piccadilly, 124 Piccadilly, and he had a bow-fronted window. And in it, on a velvet cushion, was the lock, <laughs> with a little notice saying, Anyone that can pick this lock without destroying it, um, I will award 200 guineas, which was a great deal of money. And that was in 1790. Well, it stayed there. People would come and go and say, oh, I can do this. And they couldn't. They were all defeated by this extraordinary lock. And he died. Brahma died in, I think, 1810. The lock still hadn't been picked. His son took over the company. It still exists to this day. And um, it wasn't until 1851, at uh, the Great Exhibition in the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park, where all the sort of new inventions of the industrial age, railway trains and maritime engines and so forth, were on display. Down one wing, the eastern wing, um, was this lock, this impregnable, unpickable and unpicked lock, with, beside it, in another case, illuminated with the spotlight, 200 golden guinea coins. And the note is still saying, as my grandfather said, anyone that can pick this will win this money. Well, an American arrived. And he was called Charles Hall. And he came from Boston, although he ran a company in this city called Day and Newell, which made what he claimed was an absolutely unpickable lock called, had a horrible name, the Parahutoptic Lock. He brought that over to display, but also he said, I'm going to pick the Brahma lock. And they said, you know, be our guest, go, go right ahead. And so he, he went at it with an array of tiny little tools and very powerful spotlights and magnifying glasses and little hasps and so forth. And it took 51 hours. And there was, after 51 hours of non stop work, there was this satisfying click. And the lock opened and he had done it. But Quite honestly, the Brahma company didn't mind at all. They said, yep, yeah, you've done it after however many, 60, 61 years. You've won the 200 guineas, here it is. But we don't think that our reputation is in any case being damaged because what burger is actually going to spend 51 hours at the time to need to pick, pick the lock. So, thank you, there's the money. Now, what about your lock? Let's have a look. He says, completely unpickable. Well, it wasn't that. Because a man stepped forward with a small piece of wood, and jiggling it about in a way that he found particularly effective. Fifteen minutes later, <laughs> and that man, his name was Linus Yale. So the oh. Yale man was born out of the humiliation of Charles Hall's Boston <laughs> and out of the sort of humiliation of the Joseph Brummer Lock Company. The Brummer and Yale still exist. The other thing which relates also to the social consequences of precision, relates to the man who really is the key figure in the whole story, and who was Brammer's assistant, a young engineer called Henry Maudsley. Maudsley was the man who 
came up with the way of producing things which were perfectly, perfectly flat. And he came up with micrometers that could measure to a millionth of an inch. One of them was called the Lord Chancellor, so accurate. And called the Lord Chancellor because, as he said, no one would dare argue with the Lord Chancellor. <laughs> and that's to this day in, in a museum in, in, in Tokyo. So um, the thing about uh, Maudsley is that he, let's have a look here. Um, Yes, that's a, it's a story that I don't often tell, but my wife insists that I should tell it, because I think it's a good one. He, this was at the time, once again, the Royal Navy, sailing ships. The thing about a sailing ship is that it requires a huge number of, if you remember once again from school, blocks and tackles, these uh, pulley blocks, some with just one pulley in it, some massive ones with six pulley wheels in it, that give tremendous a mechanical advantage to someone that wants to lift a huge sail or lift up an anchor. So pulley blocks are made of elm wood with oak wood and sometimes iron wheels inside them. And they were needed in huge numbers. The average warship would need about 1,400 of these pulley blocks. The Royal Navy as a whole would need 130,000 pulley blocks a year. And they were all made traditionally in cottages all over southern England by craftsmen who would make these things by hand. Then Henry Maudsley came along and said, let's analyze the processes that are necessary to turn an elm tree into a pulley block. And he worked out that there are 43 separate processes of chamfering and polishing and cutting and sawing and smoothing. And he said, I can make a machine for every one of those processes. There are 43 processes. And I'll make a machine for each one of those such that put them all in the factory, and the Royal Navy said, yes, we'll build a factory for you, and they did so in Portsmouth, in southern England. You can feed an elm tree into one end, and out at the other end will come pulley blocks. And so they did, and that factory started work in the beginning of the 19th century, and it ran impeccably until it was closed down finally in 1965. So it lasted for whatever, 150 years, with the machines never breaking down once, but the social consequence was that thousands of craftsmen had been employed to make these pulley blocks all over southern England. All of a sudden, the only people that were required in this factory, and it was a factory, it was the first real factory in southern England, were 10 unskilled men with lubricating uh, vessels to oil the machines, all of which, of course, were powered by James Watt's steam engines. And so precision had a social consequence. Already we've seen the Luddites who were breaking stocking frames and things like that. So there was a pushback which happened all along the line in, in the story of the development of precision. So just very briefly, I want to point out one bifurcation, if you like, in the, in the world of precision, which occurred in the early part of the 20th century um, in the whole business of the manufacturing of cars. And it involves two men both of whom were called Henry, both of whom were born in 1863, and both into rural poverty. One was Henry Royce, of what we might actually be Rolls Royce Motors, and the other in this country was Henry Ford. And they both, almost at the same time in their lives, when they were about 20, so in the 1880s, bought for themselves De Dion quadricycles from France. Quadricycles, and it's interesting that much of them, I'm on Shea here, who I'm sure bear this out. Many of the words related to motoring, automobile, garage, carburetor, are French in origin because the French were the originators of much of the, of the technology. And so you, what they were selling, the De Dion company, were effectively two bicycles bolted together with a frame with a small 10 horsepower, two cylinder gasoline engine mounted between them. It was noisy, it was dangerous, didn't have brakes but it was enormous fun. And Royce in England and Ford in Michigan, actually he was in Ohio at the time, bought these things and they both realized that the automobile industry was something that could be exploited and made, made to work big time. But they had this <coughs> divergence in views. I mean, before they knew each other, Henry Royce said, I'm going to make the most perfect machine ever. It's just going to be beautiful, it's going to be efficient, it's going to look wonderful quiet and startle the horses, which of course they did at that time. 
And that's what I'm going to devote my life to doing. Henry Ford, on the other hand, said, this amazing country, the United States, it deserves to be seen by the ordinary common man and woman. They ought to be able to use a device to go around this country inexpensively. I'm going to make an inexpensive motoring machine. And so what I look at in the book is the history of two cars, um, both created and manufactured during essentially the same period, from 1908 to 1927. On the one hand, there was the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, which remains to this day the apotheosis, really, of car manufacturing. Beautiful, handmade, and ever-increasing price during the, the years that it was made. Um, they made 8,000 of them. 3,000, oddly enough, in Springfield, Massachusetts. There was a Rolls-Royce factory in Massachusetts. But all of them, nearly all of them, still exist to this day. They were so impeccably made. The Model T Ford, which I also write about in great detail, same period, 1907, 1908, 1927. During that period, using Henry Ford's techniques, they made 16 million of them. And at an ever decreasing price point, the initial ones, if you bought one in 1908, it would cost you $820. If you bought it in 1927, it would cost you $219. And this was because of the application, the different application of precision. Because in the case of the Rolls Royce, you think of it as being the sinusure, if you like, of precision. But in fact, because it was made by hand, if a part didn't fit, the mechanic would simply take a file and file it down until it did fit. He would make it fit. Whereas Ford, they made on this great assembly line once they got it properly going in about 1918, 1920, it was on the ground floor. And up above were the hoppers containing all the interchangeable parts. And we come back to that idea, whether they were the parts for carburetors or brake linkages or transmissions or brake shoes. It didn't matter. They were all supposed to be manufactured to the same tolerances, and B, they would fit perfectly. And the problem was that if a piece came down the hopper, put onto the production line, and it didn't fit, then all of a sudden the production line would grind to a halt. They'd have to investigate what the problem was. The men would stand around smoking. It would cost a great deal of money before the problem was solved, and the production line could, could begin all over again. So, in an ironic way, the device that we consider is the most precise, precision is actually much less important. But precision for something which is made inexpensively but in very large numbers demands high precision because that brings about, among other things, a significant reduction in price. So that's the kind of thing that I look at in the book. So as I, as I go on in the story, I'm looking at the clock here, bring this to a halt, I, I start questioning whether precision is a good thing. I and mean, are we reaching possibly the limits, not only the actual physical limits of things we can do, but there's a question of desirability. How much more precise do we want to be? And I look at sort of two aspects of it. Mechanical precision, we're now machining things to such incredible tolerances that we may be reaching the limits of our ability actually to do it. And the classic example relates to a near dreadful accident in 2010 involving a Qantas Airbus, an A380, a double decker aircraft, flying from Singapore to, uh, to Sydney. And it took off with a full complement of nearly 460 passengers. It was powered by four Rolls Royce Trent 900 massively powerful engines, all you know, fully spooled up. They were at about 7,000 feet. Huge explosion in the number two left hands of the port side engine, the one closest to the fuselage. The engine broke into a thousand pieces, sent shrapnel through the wings, through the bottom of the fuselage. Well, they managed to wrestle it back onto the ground and no one was killed, but it was a very, very close call. It turned out that the problem was a pipe, a tiny titanium pipe, about the size of a drinking straw that had been machined in a place called Hucknall in Northern England, and mismachined by a fraction, the tiniest fraction of a millimeter, slightly out of true, which meant that the wall of this pipe was a little thinner than it should have been. And because every part is monitored electronically, they knew what had happened to it. The plane had taken off the day before, short runway, 
big number of, large number of passengers from Los Angeles. Um, the pipe came under enormous stress, but it survived. It landed in London, took off again three hours later with a fairly large number of people, not quite so many. Singapore, it survived again, took off from Singapore, metal fatigue took over 7,000 feet to broke, spurting hot oil over this titanium turbine broke in the middle of it, hugely high temperature, it flashed into flame, the blade started melting and flying off, cascading like shrapnel through the body of the engine. Disaster nearly occurred. Are we machining things now to perhaps levels of tolerance that are beyond our ability? Because at the end of the day, it's all got to be inspected by human beings. And whether we're risking, in this case, a lot of lives. So there's mechanical precision, which I wonder about, but also what I haven't really dealt with in this talk, but I do in the book in great detail, and that's electronic precision. In my, I haven't got it with me, but my telephone, I'm sure many of you have got iPhones, the beating heart of an iPhone 8 is a chip called an A11 chip made for Apple in Taiwan. It's about as big as the pinky fingernail, my fingernail, and it has 4.3 billion transistors. I mean, a transistor was only invented in 1948 in New Jersey, and it's about the original one. You can see it in the museum there. It's about as big as one's fist. But it's now been made so small that you can cram 4.3 billion of them into something as tiny as my fingernail. And the most extraordinary statistic that I came across while researching this book is that there are now more transistors in the world today than there are leaves on all the trees in all the world. <laughs> Extraordinary number. We're making 13 trillion transistors every single day. And they're being made so tiny, they're operating down at near atomic level. And if you know your Heisenberg, I'm not suggesting that I do, but things down at that kind of level start behaving in a very peculiar fashion. And the scientists say, oh, don't worry, we'll get it smaller. We'll use you know, quantum computing and optical computing. But do we really want to? But I'm not a Luddite in this sense at all, but I do wonder whether we should maybe draw back and say, what about the joy of imprecision, if you like? And I went to study that in Japan, and specifically to the Seiko factory. Now, we all think of Japan as a place of high precision. You know, Canon and Nikon and indeed Seiko, the word effectively means precision. They invented the quartz movement that, that was under has in her very nice watch, and it has very few moving parts, and it will deliver pretty astonishing accuracy, although yours apparently is not as accurate as it should be. They're much more accurate today. Um, so I went along to have a look at Seiko, and uh, they have a factory in a place called Morioka in the north of the main island. And we went up, it's in a bamboo forest on the slopes of a volcano, and um, you go up to the production line where they're making quartz movements in, in very large numbers, 25,000 a day, all with robots, it's very noisy, and these devices are being sent all over the world, it's a big export business. But I think that my mind, as they could sense, I was a little bit disappointed at seeing yet another production line, and dealing yet again with ultra high precision things. So they took me into a, another part, also on the same floor, went through a set of double doors, and it became a sort of cathedral-like calm went into a room where there were 20 or 30 men and women, each one working at a desk, a sort of carol, and they had magnifying glasses and tweezers and various devices with which they were assembling by hand mechanical wrist wristwatches with mainsprings and hairsprings and jeweled movements and escapements. And I thought, well, this is wonderful, that however much they delight commercially in the success of the quartz watch movement, which Seiko never patented, they allow anyone to, to use their movements, they still produce by hand mechanical watches. Um, and I love that particularly because the little old farmhouse we live in in, um, in Berkshire County, we have in the main house eight mechanical <coughs> clocks. And I, it's my duty every Sunday morning, we also have a barograph, which is also mechanical, which records the weekly variations in the atmospheric pressure. And I wind them every Sunday morning. I get up and I go up to the top of the house and there's an old British Railways <coughs> clock up there and there various clocks, grandfather clocks, long case clocks and things. 
And by the time I've finished my breakfast time, all the clocks are, and I've moved their hands back or forward, just as you described, they're all in rate. And by Monday, they're still in rate. But by Tuesday, they're starting to fall out of rate. By Wednesday, Thursday, it's a complete shambles. <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, it's got to be all done again. But it brings back to my mind the delightful moment in um, Dorothy L. Sayers' uh, novel, Gordy Knight, which I'm sure you have here, which you should read if you haven't, uh, talking about walking back through Oxford late one night and listening to the college clocks striking midnight, striking, as she said, midnight in friendly disagreement. <laughs> and I love that concept because I think there is much, after all, there's no straight lines in nature. We are flawed, we are imprecise. And to be tyrannized in a way by ultra precision, by fetishizing it, we are perhaps losing the joy of, which the Japanese and the Koreans have not done because they award titles and indeed pensions to people they call living national treasures who do beautiful work in non-precise arts like woodworking and ceramics and lacquerware. And they, it seems, have achieved a sort of equipoise. So I want to show you one final thing. And I'll let you go home. Thank you very much indeed. Let me just show you this one little thing. I mentioned Colin Povey. Colin Povey was the man in Florida who introduced me to this subject and said he put a right book. And he, I mentioned to you, was a scientific glass blower. Well, we didn't, didn't meet for seven years. He eventually came to a talk I gave at the very beginning of this book tour in Washington, D.C. He flew up. Lovely, lovely man. He and his wife came up. But a few days beforehand, to welcome this book into the world, he sent what he said was a trinket. I have it here now. I've been trying not to break it, and I have it. And I'm wondering whether anyone here knows what it is. And I should, before I shame you, say that every audience thus far knows what this is. And in Pasadena, in California, about 20 people instantly cried out what it is. So what, what is this? You know what it is. Klein bottle. You, sir, you said a Klein bottle. Yeah. Well, anybody else? Well, it is a Klein bottle. K-L-E-I-N. I'm sure you all know what a Mobius strip is, where you take a strip of paper and turn it once, and it becomes a two-dimensional object with one surface. Well, this is a three-dimensional object with one surface. It's completely useless. It's <laughs> terribly, terribly, terribly difficult to make, particularly where the tube, which has a hole in it, goes through this already blown part of the, uh, of the wall of the vessel. But yes, a, a non-conforming structure, mathematically very interesting thing, very, very fiendishly difficult to make. But what I love about it is that Colin Povey, who's obsessed with, fascinated by the history of precision, nonetheless cleaves to the idea that you can make beautiful things which are imprecise because this is there's nothing precise about it at all mm -hmm. it's completely imprecise and yet i think as i hope all of you do too as well that imprecise it may be but it is very beautiful mm -hmm. so thank you all very much indeed Yes, these things are created by us. You know, a meter is effectively arbitrary. Humankind has always, through his entire history, measured things initially according to his body. I mean, the cubit, you know, the Egyptians or the Babylonians, the cubit is the length of the pharaoh's forearm from the tip of his finger to his elbow. The inch is the length of your thumb from your fingernail to the knuckle. The foot is the foot. Mille passus, a thousand paces, is the mile to the Roman legionnaires. <coughs> then the French came along and said, you know, the body is an imperfect thing. The only thing that is absolutely uh, 
impeccable in terms of its stability is planet Earth. So we'll measure things according to that. And this is a classic example of something being created by us. The French drew a line, a meridian, from the pole to the equator through Paris, of course, and <laughs> said, let's we measure it very carefully, and then divide it by 10 million, and called that the meter. And that was cast in platinum, and a rod existed, club cast in the 1880s, and it was until the 1960s, the meter. All of these now, thanks to James Clark Maxwell, the man that divined the electromagnetic theory of light and you know, gave us the electromagnetic spectrum, said that the Earth is as useless for measuring things against as is the human body, because it varies in certain so gravity to deal with, it changes its shape, speed of rotation, all sorts of things. The only thing which is absolutely certain is the wavelength of radiation from certain molecules and atoms, like krypton and cesium and so forth. So everything should be, in his view, and this was in 1870, it really didn't catch on until the 1940s and 50s, everything should be measured in terms of radiation. And so one by one, all these rather romantic things, whether they're, I mean, a classic one was in Korea, and I, I love the idea, there's a mountain outside Seoul, and in Korean mythology, an angel comes down every century and wafts her wing against the surface at the top of the mountain. The time it will take for that mountain to be eroded to sea level is a unit of time in Korean mythology. So all of these things will be swept away and replaced simply by numbers, except for one thing. And that one thing is the unit of mass, which exists as we speak in Paris, in Sèvres, where they make porcelain, um, under three bell jars. It's a body of platinum iridium cast in London in the 1880s. And it is the kilogram. It is the unit of mass. It's about as big as a Zippo cigarette lighter. And it, it's the, everything to do with mass in the world is compared to it. It is literally incomparable. It is compared to nothing. It is the kilogram. And of course, not all countries go along with the, the SI system, most notably Liberia, uh, Myanmar, and the United States. <laughs> the rest of the world is very sensible. But anyway, come the 30th of November this year, the kilogram will no longer be defined in terms of this because it's, it's got little air bubbles in it and they bleed out and it changes mass infinitesimally tiny, but has done over the years. And so it's being replaced by a complex convection of mathematics uh, combining the Planck constant and the speed of light. And I regret that. I don't want all the measurements in the world to be reduced to numbers. I have a soft spot for platinum. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thank you. So, would you comment on the role of the Connecticut River gun makers in the history of <coughs> Very, very much so. Connecticut River, we live very close to the Connecticut River. It's, it's clocks and guns. And of course, the Springfield Armory, um, famous now, of course, for the Webster's Dictionary is manufactured or produced. Um, was central to the making of, of, of guns. And the crucial thing, the, the story that surprised me most of all, was if you go back to the flintlock, the mechanism of the flintlock, of an early gun. A flintlock has about 10 parts to it. The trigger, of course, the thing that actually strikes the spark on the flint. Things called the frizzle and the pan and the spring. And a Frenchman called Honoré Blanc well apprised of what was going on in Britain in the 1790s, said interchangeable parts must be brought to the art of making guns. Because on the battlefield, if a soldier breaks his trigger, or if he did before the 1790s, he would have to replace the whole gun. Whereas he said, make every component part interchangeable. And then all you have to do is just find a box with triggers and put a new trigger in and box your own, off you go. And so Honoré Blanc devised this demonstration where he created 10 boxes, each one with a part, or many parts, a lot of triggers in this box, a lot of springs in this, a lot of bristle bands in that, and said to the assembled worthies who gathered 
to see a demonstration. You know, pick any part from any box and you easily assemble them into a flintlock, and people did. But the most notable attendee at that meeting was the American minister to France at the time, and that was Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson got it in an instant. It's an indication of his prescience and his intelligence that he realized that this was a very important step forward and that this method of manufacturing could be applied almost immediately in the United States, where there was, among other things, a pressing need for guns. There were two armories at the time, one in Springfield and one in Harpers Ferry in Virginia. And so he sent a message over to Washington to the Secretary of War saying, we must follow Honoré Blanc, there's another chap called Ribobal, follow these two procedures in making our guns. And so the word went out through the bureaucracy in Washington, would anyone like to get a contract for making 8,000 guns on these principles for the American army? And a man raised his hand, said, I can do it, and that was Eli Whitney. Whitney, who had become <coughs> famous but not rich for making the cotton gin. And he said, I can do it, and I'll do it at, uh, at Harpers Ferry. And so he staged a demonstration. But without going into the details of it, he cheated. He didn't make interchangeable parts at all. And he managed very cleverly, by sleight of hand, to hoodwink the great and the good that came down to see him. And the people in the in an equivalent of the Pentagon said, well, you seem to have done something quite remarkable, so we'll give you the contract. And they gave him the contract, and <coughs> the guns were eight years old, and none of them worked. So to the engineering community, although to the school child in this country, Eli Whitney is a hero, to the engineering community, and I've had such a lot of letters saying, at last, you know, we've read this in a mainstream book, he's regarded as a charlatan, a crook, and a rogue, who should be stricken from the record. So, I always thought a book on this subject would be called The Screw. And start with uh, something made out of wood in, I don't know, Byzantine uh, times and brought forward the machine tools. Uh, is that a theme that interested you at all, or is that just... No, no, no. I, mean, I use... Uh, uh, oddly enough, the, the, I mentioned that the title of the book in England is exactly, and the motif is a screw because of the involvement of this man called Joseph Whitworth, who still we measure our screws, even in this country, according to BSW, British Standard Whitworth Measurements. Mm. Screw is very important in this story, but the book that I could never um, think of competing with is... Um, Witto Rubsinski's book called One Good Turn, which is the history of the screw and the screwdriver, which is, of course, open to all sorts of other interpretations, but is in fact called the <laughs> mechanics. And is incredibly, incredibly good. It's a small volume. I've got his name right, haven't I? Yeah. yeah. Witold Rubsinski, I think. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful book. And he was very helpful. We corresponded because he's at Penn, I think. And uh, so you're quite right. It could have been called The Screw, but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> did I see? Were, were you what gentleman? Well, I was curious, how did they come about figuring out the amount of leaves on trees? <laughs> I, I know it, it is quite easy, but I mean, it's like counting birds. And uh, if you simply take photographs of, let's say, one square meter in Brazil, and one square meter in New Zealand, and one square meter in Massachusetts, count the trees, count the leaves, count the trees in those squares, count the leaves on any one tree, and then do complex multiplication. It is very easy. And the number is confirmed by everyone easy from in, I think about easy as relative. Well, you, I think if you've got a good powerful computer with an A11 chip with 4.3 <laughs> transistors, it's probably quite easy. Right. Thank you. Um, have oh, one second. Do you, do you have a uh, premise or an idea about what your next book might be? I do. It's under discussion at the moment. I don't want to jinx it. Put it this way, it begins in Oklahoma on the 22nd of April, 1889, in the town of Guthrie, if that helps anybody. Yes. It's in Guthrie, Oklahoma, 22nd of April, 1889. There was an event there, and I want to sort of extrapolate on that event and write a book about things related to that event all over the world. So, that will tell us somewhat. Thank you very much.